Hi, I'm Lynn Davis, and welcome to Discussions on Democracy. I'm the program manager for a nonpartisan nonprofit organization called Healthy Democracy that designs and coordinates innovative deliberative democracy programs. We're partnering with the City of Eugene to facilitate a first of its kind review panel. The issue up for deliberation is the implementation of HB 2001, a House bill passed by the Oregon Legislature in 2019 that mandates that all cities in Oregon expand the types of housing they allow in single family zones. Our goal in partnering with the City of Eugene, as always, is high quality public engagement. The panel has already been selected through a randomized lottery based process that helps to ensure broad and accurate representation. The review panel is already underway, in fact, and so far it looks like it's a really wonderful and diverse group of folks, as it always is. The purpose of this show, Discussions on Democracy, is to explain the process the panel is going through. This is the third in a series of shows we'll be doing uh, to help us take a deep dive into the process. And this one is particularly about the process that's happening in the room or the virtual room. And joining me to talk about that is the lead moderator for this project, Alex Ranieri. Alex, thanks so much for being with us. Absolutely. Thanks so much for inviting me, Lynn. For sure. Well, let's first talk about just the process overall and sort of give a, an overview starting with uh, what's happening in the next month or so. Uh, this is November and December 2020, and then also in the spring. Absolutely. Yeah, so this first part of the process um, that spans from November through early December um, is kind of lumped into three main phases or nine sessions. And we've just completed the first three sessions. Um, like you, I'm very excited about the group we have. And um, so I'll just kind of run down, you know, phase by phase what we're doing in this process. Um, phase one has, has really focused on just getting the panel situated with the context of the issue, um, you know, housing, uh, zoning, uh, kind of basics and planning. And um, we've heard from a, a number of background experts um, to kind of get the panel just understanding the issue at hand and clarifying any terminology and kind of understanding just how planning processes at the local level work. Um, and what we're trying to do also is weave in a fair amount of lived experience and lived expertise from the panelists. So both holding um, outside expertise and lived experience in equal value. And next week, we'll be moving into a phase where the panelists have the opportunity to call additional background experts to kind of fill in their understanding of the issue and the bill, um, as well as stakeholders. So to, to really get a wide range of perspectives on, on housing, um, how this bill could be implemented. Um, and the panelists are, are responsible for calling those background experts, as you know. Uh, and then we'll start identifying principles of so our phase three and, and you know, moving into December will really be centered around the panelists beginning to write the principles that will be the directive for the city of Eugene to write its implementation plan. Do you want to talk a little bit about what our process will look like in, in 2021 in the next phase? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is a really interesting pro one of the really interesting things about this project for us is this the fact that there's going to be a couple of feedback loops, we call them, which is basically opportunities for the for the panel to come back and in this case evaluate the city's work. So the city will take those principles that are developed in early December and come back some weeks later with a first draft of the code language um, for this new zoning code and uh, check it with the panel, essentially. The panel will look at their principles, will review the code and hear presentations about it. Uh, we'll uh, look, you know, search for any Im other information that they need or call additional folks that they feel they need and then uh, tell the city, hey, this it matches up or doesn't match up with our principles in X, Y, or Z way. And then they'll actually do that again uh, a little bit later and look at a second draft. Um, and then also in that spring sort of phase, they, uh, two phases there, they will uh, draft recommendations sort of in general for the city of Eugene on uh, public engagement and how their experience in this panel um, should 
should influence what the city does in terms of public engagement for other projects in the future, whatever that means to them. There's already committees uh, sort of working on collecting information that might help them um, sort of review their own experience, essentially. Um, I'm excited that the city has uh, is incorporating that mandate to the panel. I think that'll be a really exciting, a new kind of product from one of these processes. Totally, yeah, and it's really unusual that 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 um, a that a local government is sort of willing to do sort of feedback loops, let alone two feedback loops, in something like this. So uh, that's that's uh, you know a, quite a significant development for us. Um, and, and I know other people in other places are watching it closely for that, partly for that reason. Um, I wanted to, we wanted to talk about uh, a few sort of of the, the underlying principles of this work as a way to talk about some of the stuff that's happening in those different, uh, different sections. And mm -hmm. I know the first one that we wanted to talk about was this sort of underlying ethos of collaboration that these things are sort of one of their most important features is that they try to shift the paradigm from our sort of the, the political paradigm that we all grew up in, at least in this country, of sort of debate-oriented politics toward um, a, a, a wholly collaborative kind of oriented politics, which doesn't mean uh, that, that there isn't uh, argument, not, not a bit, uh, or, or that there aren't a multitude of diversities of, uh, of, of viewpoints among the many other diversities in the room, but, uh, but just that collaboration comes first. And yeah. maybe you could talk about what, how that sort of plays out in this first section, the information gathering section of the panel. Yeah, absolutely. So the metaphor that I know you use frequently is getting folks on the same side of the table, right? So we're used to sitting at opposite sides of the table and kind of debating over an issue. And um, what we do in phase one, particularly as panelists are, are just beginning to get to know each other and just beginning to get to know the issue, is really putting them all on the same side of this metaphorical table and, and having their task be to just understand the context and the lay of the land. And that kind of, you know, helps folks get into a collaborative mindset from, from the outset. So, um, you know, not seeing their fellow, fellow panelists through the common lens of um, ideology or, you know, particular beliefs and perspectives right from the beginning but having a chance to get to know each other, to share their experiences, um, lived expertise, and, and really learning together can, can kind of foster that, that sense of collaboration that then I think the idea is that that runs through the process and helps the actual development of their product, of these principles, um, be more collaborative as well. Yeah, totally. And it's different than some processes in that um, whereas uh, there is sometimes sort of a, an introduction to, um, to, to viewpoint or argument-based stuff right at the beginning, this is like a very conscious effort to sort of set a problem, quote unquote, for the panel of gathering information so that everybody is like, is, is, is united behind a common sort of enemy, which is a lack of information. So, okay, perfect, let's, let's unite behind that, such that when we get to those little bit later stages in early December that you describe where they're talking about getting down to brass tacks about what the principles are, that, that there's sort of a, a level of camaraderie, as you mentioned, that, that the panel can kind of get, okay, we've, we've, had, this ex we've had this uniting experience together, and, and I, I know you, and I know that you know we're going to be okay, even if we're having a difficult political conversation right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of that too is really the relationship building that we're trying to make, make space for in this first phase. Um, like you're saying, if they you know have the opportunity to really get to know each other as as people, um, you know the the effort to to have those deliberations and and more intense decisions later on in in good faith is increased. Yeah, and actually that relates to, to sort of the next section a little bit in that um, one, one of the other sort of reasons why we really wanted to, uh, to emphasize sort of panelist experience in this process in, in the early days in particular was to sort of make, make the point 
to the panel and everyone else that there, there is a tremendous amount of experience and expertise in the room already. This sort of random representative sample represents a, an incredible unique opportunity for, for people to sort of talk to this little miniature city in a room. I wanted to move on to the second sort of theme, underlying principle behind all this kind of work for us, which is transferring power from this organizing staff or the moderating staff to the panel itself, uh, which we do in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, do you want to talk about a couple of those key ways? I think a, a primary way that we, we talk about this is um, the panelists in these processes, which I think are really unique in you know, the myriad public engagement strategies that exist <laughs> in the world, um, a unique characteristic here is that the panelists are seen in the process as the decision makers and we as the moderating team and you know logistics staff and you as you know the holder keeper of the process or both of us um are really there to support the panelists to do the best work they can possibly do and so we really see ourselves as executing what the panelists ask us to execute um, you know, supporting small group conversations in a way that, uh, you know, supports people to share airtime and be respectful of each other, um, but not really meddling in and this, this kind of bridges out to many different themes and, and philosophies here, but um, not meddling in the content and really, really allowing the panelists to step up to the plate, learn the issues and, and have full control over um, you know, how they organize information, how they learn about the issues, and how they craft their, their end product. Yeah. So, yeah and I, oh, totally. I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, finish your thought. Finish your thought. <laughs> I'll just, I'll give one example of how that happens in our, in our actual moderation um, approach is that I think is pretty distinct from other approaches, which is that in small groups, um, the moderators are, again, just fully there for process. And whereas a traditional facilitation style might include, you know, lots of summarizing and synthesizing and kind of paraphrasing what people have said, what we're doing is actually taking down, you know, their, their ideas almost word for word sometimes. Um, and again, just holding, holding the process and, and not intervening in, in the content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sometimes say non-directive facilitation or moderation. We use the word moderation, in fact, rather than facilitation to give it sort of a, a non-directive flavor and uh, that, that we're sort of moderating and helping to yeah, provide that sort of space of, of respect, but, but, uh, but not sort of facilitating toward a, toward a certain sort of uh, certain outcome. Or, uh, for example, facilitator, the facilitators themselves looking for consensus, looking to build things as you might in a traditional, if you've been through a, a, a strategy meeting with a facilitator or something like that, where the facilitator is much more active. Um, but it doesn't mean the facilitators don't, aren't, aren't active necessarily. Uh, should be careful about that because the, the facilitators are absolutely, or moderators are absolutely active if there, there is anything that sort of threatens the process or threatens the space. Uh, if there's sort of a lack of respect between anyone, uh, or if uh, the panel or when the panel needs sort of uh, a little bit of guidance on what's happening when and that kind of stuff. Um, and it should be said, there's a, there, the panel doesn't have sort of 100% control over everything because that's not practical in, in what is quite a, a jam-packed process. But there, but there is, uh, hopefully as much as possible and increasing with every new process, more power in the hands of the panel. So for example, like the, the steering committee, there's a steering committee that, um, that we'll talk about in a different episode that uh, selected the first week of background experts, sort of preloaded into the process before the panel got there. Um, and this steering committee with different stakeholders also prepared a menu of potential future speakers for the panel. And then the panel will select all of its rest, all the rest of its, uh, the folks who are called before it. Um, and, and likewise, you know, we are doing a process design before each meeting at the general direction of the steering committee in terms of the overall process, but on a day-to-day -day sort of minute-by-minute thing. 
we're making a lot of decisions about that. However, uh, when something comes up, as it always does, it does at practically every session um, where we get feedback, we we end up. Uh, including stuff in the process or, or dropping it out a little bit. So one of the ways that we also sort of try to uh, respect the, the panel as in, in the process design is even though we can't co-design the whole process with the panel, uh, it is at a bare minimum vital that we tell the panel and the public as well why things are happening the way they're happening, which is part of the reason for this whole series. So, uh, but we try to do it during the, during the process as well. And there's a couple other things built into the process that hopefully uh, sort of turn power over to the panel. Alex? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of those other things is the task committees. That is a new, a new process design element of this process. Um, and just further helping even transfer these kind of more staff support roles over to the panelists themselves. So we've, we have five task committees this time. Two are kind of helping um, do the recording of the panelists' lived experiences and outside expert presenters that come in. Um, one is going to be responsible for mostly drafting the principles and, and just kind of getting that process started and of course then running it by the rest of the, the panel as well. Um, and then we have a process oversight group this time, which is kind of responsible for some of that meta reflection about how this is going and you know what kinds of public engagement the city should engage, engage in in the future. Um, and we also have a community liaison group to help you know spread the word about the process just like the series. So, so those are just some other examples of how we're trying to kind of transfer the, the ownership of the process, oversight, and even that, you know, drafting, record keeping, um, those kinds of roles over to panelists themselves. Right, sort of the, the parts of the panel being their own staff for various parts of the process. So the recording groups kind of being the, the lead staff in some ways during this first portion, the drafting and writing um, group sort of is going to take the lead a little bit later on, uh, and the community liaisons and the process folks are, are a little bit later on in the process where they're going to take the lead. And also on that process oversight committee, a couple members on a rotating basis within that committee will serve on the steering committee. So there's sort of a back and forth there that doesn't even involve us. Um, we we sort of we sit on the steering committee, but we are not kind of overlords over the whole thing. Is is what we're trying to avoid, um, and uh, and not only because that's sort of more legit, but it just makes our job better and easier <laughs> to to not be sort of the the final people making all decisions in in a in a room somewhere. Um, the other thing that I feel like is important to mention that, that is really different than other processes, at least in my experience, is that we don't do any editing whatsoever of the final documents um, ever. Not a single word, not a single typo. Everything is done by the panel, and that's the end of it. Um, and that'll be true in, in December when, when the panel is doing its first principles, and that'll be true in its final report in the spring. Um, and I guess just to sort of wrap up this section, there's a, um, I guess the, the sort of paradigm shift here uh, that we're trying to do is to um, shift from an environment where there's sort of a, a hierarchical relationship here, or as much of a hierarchical relationship between this sort of facilitator who's standing in front of the room directing the orchestra to what may be more common at like a city council meeting or something where the council is there on the dais and there's support staff to, to help and, and do work for them. And we want that relationship with the panel on the dais. And, and that is quite a different thing um, than usually exists. And, and what makes this especially different than sort of a standard focus group, uh, which is what some people confuse it with sometimes, um, I feel like. So yeah. let's move on to the next topic here, if we can which is, uh, you already alluded to this a little bit, but it's the separation between content and process. And another thing that makes these quite unique, at least in my experience, um, typically we as kind of the, the uh, process folks would also be doing a bunch of content stuff. And this is confusing all the time. In fact, I've gotten several emails 
uh, from folks uh, asking to insert various pieces of content into the process. And we're never going to do that. They, uh, they have to come, on, come in through some other means. And uh, Alex, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think this is a really unique thing about, about the work that Healthy Democracy does and, and the unique approach here, definitely. Um, and I think this really goes back to kind of keeping the, the integrity of uh, our role in this process. So partnering with an organization like City of Eugene, having a steering committee, um, and having the panelists empowered to choose the experts and the information that they want to draw from um, allows us to just be in this position of exclusively holding the process and um, you know, avoiding any perception of bias on the issues. And I think that um, that kind of integrity in that very specific role helps, at least my hope is that it helps, it helps um, panelists feel empowered to deliberate between you know, very diverse perspectives um, feel that the moderating team has no stake, you know, in the issue, no um, inclination one way or the other, that we're just there to support all, all perspectives to be heard. Um, and I think it, it also lends uh, a lot of credibility in, in the communities that we, you know, do these processes for and in, um, that we're nonpartisan and um, really interested in a legitimate process that fosters really deep deliberation and um, and have no stake in the outcome. Yeah, totally. You sort of mentioned the the way that we get around that, which is rather than as as, as most often happens, where we would be producing some sort of introductory briefing materials or would be calling experts ourselves, who we thought you know sort of uh, would fill certain roles. We um, we have sort of three kind of entities that do that. The city, who, who has a number of briefing documents that they provided to the panel, um, and, and also uh, arranged the, the composition of, this, of the steering committee in this case, in, in consultation with us uh, to try to get a, a balanced group of stakeholders. Um, but that is our, our only concern in that case. Um, and and then the sort of overarching convening question also in consultation with us to make sure the scope is right given the time and all that. And then the steering committee itself, which does sort of the heavy lifting in terms of these initial background experts preparing the menu that the panel selects from for future, uh, for future presenters, not that the panel has to stick to that menu absolutely 100% at all. Um, and uh, and then, and then prevent, uh, uh, potentially providing um, for if there, are, you know, if there are sort of gaps in the content, uh, sort of watching out for those, which the steering committee will be doing this week. Um, and then the third group being the panel itself, uh, which was not always part of our processes. We've always had these other, you know, we've always sort of pawned off the, the content uh, onto other folks uh, in the best possible for the best possible reasons, but. We haven't always had the panel do as much as they're doing now, which is selecting most of their own experts, doing their own independent research, uh, demanding other data that they need from the city or, uh, or yeah, the city mostly to, to go get for them. Um, and then, of course, the panel is doing all the work in terms of putting all the pieces together and writing the final thing. Um, uh, and. But there's one, there's one other sort of uh, interesting part of this that is somewhat unique to us, which is around the process design. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, if I, if I sense what you're getting at there <laughs> is that, <laughs> is that um, healthy democracy you know, wants this model to spread. So I know, Lynn, that you're super connected with the international network of folks doing lottery-based deliberations like these. And um, I think part of the process design that, that we use for projects like this is really is issue agnostic so that it can be easily replicable in other places. And so we're, we're not an advocate for the issue, but we are advocates for the process 
and we want this model to spread and um, you know be designed in such a way that it could be plucked out of a, a handbook or you know <laughs> healthy democracy website and applied to you know essentially any um, with with minor tweaks any kind of local government um, policy question. Yeah, exactly, and 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 not sort of that it's a necessarily one size fits all not at all in fact that there that there are sort of multiple different models of these things depending on the the type of issue level of complexity the number of feedback loops needed etc uh, like we did a project about a year ago in milwaukee oregon uh in the portland area that was a had the same kind of progression in many ways but was a different project and that it was a very specific kind of single policy topic in that case on how much city council members should be paid and so it followed uh, a different model it was about half the cost and um, and about two-thirds of the time and and had some slightly different different bits to it but that is that is sort of a model that, that works for that type of thing this is a very complex sort of multifaceted planning project with technical stuff and feedback loops and so it has to be a different thing but hopefully we're designing this in a way uh, not only for replicability but for its sort of credibility now that we're not sort of letting unconscious bias of this particular issue work its way into the process design because we're designing for every issue that looks vaguely like this yeah yeah absolutely yeah, and, and I, I totally agree that multiple, you know, degrees of complexity and um, and a, a really keen eye towards the detail of the process design is absolutely necessary as we kind of duplicate these efforts in, in different places. And I think the the accessibility is really what I was trying to get at there. That we we hope that we're designing in such a way that that um, others can run with this work and and see the value in, in these processes and and use them in other places as well. Yeah. Totally. That actually reminds me that there's one, there's, well, there's multiple themes that we didn't have on our list here, but one really important one is accessibility. You mentioned sort of accessibility for, for, for other cities or places or organizations doing these processes, but also there's accessibility is a massive sort of um, foundational idea behind a, a lot of the stuff we do, particularly in this online kind of world. Uh, we're sort of bending over backwards uh, to, to make it, try to make it as accessible as possible. It's difficult, um, but uh, providing hotspots, laptops for folks who need them, web, webcams for folks who need them. In, when we do the in-person in, in processes, um, you know, there's, there's payment for, uh, for uh, folks to travel or to, to stay in hotels or you know if that's if that's necessary or for child or elder care at home food and all that stuff um, but that's also a, an issue in the process itself large print font etc cetera, etc cetera, language translation um, and um, yeah so so just another another thing that i thought it was really important that we mentioned even though it wasn't on our list here yeah absolutely Let's go to our, our next sort of topic here, which is the decision-making processes. Now we're getting a little bit oh, nicely into the weeds here about some of the, <laughs> some of the details of, of how we design these things. Mm -hmm. And um, could you talk a little bit about how, you know, sort of our philosophy with regard to decision-making in the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think kind of an overarching theme here is that we're uh, you know, we do most of our intensive deliberations in, in small groups, not the large group, um, so that people can feel really uh, comfortable deliberating together and then, you know, filter that back to the, the large, large panel. Um, but I think one of the principles guiding those small group deliberations is that we're aiming for consensus. So we really want to explore a diversity of perspectives enough so that you know, people can be swayed and, and folks can arrive at the same page together, but we're never forcing that. Um, it is, you know, again, back to the facilitation or moderation style. Um, we're never kind of, you know, coercing folks to form consensus if if it's not there. We're just, you know, documenting what's, what exists in the room and helping people have um, meaningful conversations about it. So I think this is an interesting process in that we're moving away from um you know a 
uh, consensus, and, <laughs> sorry, an unnatural or kind of forced consensus model, but we also don't want to use kind of traditional uh, voting models whenever possible. Um, what we do instead is try to work towards uh, prioritization of options or, you know, decision making formats that allow for many voices and allow for kind of a, a range of perspectives to be to be in the space in, in an order of priority rather than um, kind of, you know, on the table or off the table. Yeah, think, totally. Uh, sort of a little bit more uh, complex view of decision making or something than we normally get to try to break out of kind of binary decision making and into, well, there may be a gradient of, of feeling on particular issues, even for a particular person. Um, and, and trying to represent that as best as possible while, as you said, still move toward uh, shared decision making, because of course some decisions need to be made about, about these things, that's the whole point. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and, and I think another, another sort of aspect uh, of, of that's key to decision making is to never go into decisions without uh, deliberation, substantial deliberation, uh, best case scenario, iterative deliberation between smaller to larger groups and exploring the sort of reasons why. So uh, it's probably really annoying to panelists sometimes, but all of our sort of documents, for example, when, when a panelist wants to submit independent research to their fellow panelists, the form that they use has a, you know information about summarize what, what the piece of information is you attach the 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 document that you want to share and then there's a big section for and tell you know why is this important how does this how does this relate to our our discussion um, and and or stand up to our criteria uh, and that's sort of important throughout the process that we that we never detach sort of things from from why either for ourselves from a process perspective or or uh, you know, allow that to happen kind of um, in the in the process itself with the content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think that's I think that's absolutely crucial. Yeah, I don't have very much to add, but um, but we would never yeah we would never make a decision without kind of everybody having an opportunity to express how they arrived at that at that decision or or their viewpoint. And that's actually a, a kind of good segue into the next section because there have been a couple of times, at least in my tenure at, at HD, well, there have been many times when we haven't followed a, a number of these things that we're mentioning that we're, we're following quite well in this project. Uh, I, think, I don't think we've mentioned anything that we're not doing, um, but, uh, but you know, this, these things are, uh, have been done many times. We've been doing them for 12 years. But, uh, and, and the field has been around in its sort of modern form for about 40, 50 years now. But uh, they're also still new. And, and really, democracy should always be new, should always be innovated on, or else it, it, it dies uh, or, or becomes sort of <laughs> moribund. But, um, but for example, there have been times in the past where we haven't always allowed for sufficient deliberation before moving through some kind of very carefully designed decision-making process. And, um, and I should say, as a, as, as a matter of fact, that, that didn't happen in the steering committee. We, we, we flubbed up a little bit in not allowing enough steering committee meetings before the panel started in this case. That was a new, a new process, the way that the steering committee worked in this process, and, and we didn't time it as well as we should have, such that there was sufficient deliberation there. Uh, it, I think they still did a lot of heavy work. Uh, I just meant folks kind of moving a little bit faster than um, was was desirable and submitting, you know, filling out surveys in between instead of voting in person and that kind of thing, um, which is not ideal. Uh, and, and it should be said that always happens, always will happen, uh, that we sort of make mistakes on things. Um, and, uh, and it's why, and it sort of brings to this, this last topic here, which is, an, an ethos of, of candidness and constant improvement. That, that we will never be scared about admitting things that we didn't do so well uh, in fear of 
folks criticizing the process or sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater uh, or, or, or whatever. We think that there is a really uh, important and differentiating value with being candid, that, that we have way too many people sort of trying to hide things. And, uh, and the last thing we need to do is, is, sort of, is sort of not just be very open about when, when things happen because they, they always have and always will. Um, and, but there's a few, there's a few sort of a, a number of ways where it's not just sort of us recognizing our own failings, but also things built into the, the, the structure of the process that ensure that, uh, that, that we are sort of being uh, held to account on multiple sides. You want to talk about some of those? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'll share that, you know, my first project with Healthy Democracy was last year in the Milwaukee project um, as a moderator and then over the summer with the uh, Citizens Assembly on COVID. And one thing that has really surprised and impressed me about the way Healthy Democracy does these processes is the frequency of, of debriefs with the moderating team and kind of the, the really meaningful changes that can happen throughout a process based on both the moderators, you know, individual feedback and the feedback that the unique kinds of feedback that moderators have uh, access to in their small groups because of those more, you know, small personal interactions with uh, panelists in the processes. So that's been really impressive to me. Um, Healthy Democracy does daily surveys uh, from, you know, in any of these processes after every single session, we invite panelists to give their feedback about how they think, think these things are going. Um, and that's, again, deeply incorporated into the planning and the process design from, from day to day. So those are a couple examples. Do you, do you have others to touch on? Yeah, yeah, no, those are two of the, two of the important ones. Now we're having a moderator debrief for this first week of sessions, actually just later today. I mean, in addition to the meetings that we have at each session, um, and and yeah, I think it's important to mention that there's that there sort of need to be windows into these small groups because there's a lot of important stuff that happens in the small groups, and even though the information that 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 comes out of the small groups filters into the process and and comes out in the final report and and before that in the large group sort of deliberations later on it's still really important that there's monitoring happening in those small groups to make sure that that the small group moderators are are being you know are not sort of introducing uh unconscious bias or are not playing favorites or are you know are, are not otherwise sort of inhibiting the the deliberative quality of the panel um and in addition to the panelists filling out surveys um, and moderators reporting back, there are also um, independent uh, evaluators. In this process, it's, it's a different than in our previous processes where we've had academic uh, researchers uh, following the process and sitting in on the small groups. In this one, they're actually peer reviewers, our peers in other countries, in Australia, Canada, Spain, the UK, and maybe somewhere else, I forget, uh, who are sitting in on various different meetings of the, of the panel. The steering committee also provides a lot of oversight, even though they're, they're not there, they're hearing from other sources, and, the, um, and are sort of the final arbiters, the final sort of court of last resort, should there be disputes. Uh, and uh, there's also this oversight committee on the panel itself, which is a new aspect of this project, where the panel will be reviewing its own survey results and, and, and giving feedback in real time about the process, in addition to, in addition to feedback about what the next process uh, uh, maybe should look like. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add on that, Alex, before we wrap up here? I wouldn't add any other, you know, specifics on process design there, but I do think this is uh, one of the like core, core pieces that really sets these processes um, and sets healthy democracy apart from, from other folks doing this work. I mean, I'm sure everybody is constantly improving as much as they can. And, um, you know, in my experience with this organization, I think it's just really impressive how, uh, how much of an eye towards uh, self criticism and improvement and constantly soliciting feedback um, there has been and how 
how agile these processes are even, you know, even in the middle to accommodate the needs of, of staff, of panelists and of, you know, outside stakeholders as well. So constant improvement is, uh, I think, the thing that ties, ties a lot of these uh, principles together. Well, that's, that's very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Lynn. It's been great to chat. And thank you for watching. Be sure to be here for our next episode when we discuss what it's like to actually be inside the process as a panelist. I'm Lynn Davis, Program Manager for Healthy Democracy. See you next time.